SJC 13521, Conservation Law Foundation et al. versus Energy Facilities Siting Board. Okay, whenever you're ready, um, Attorney Turner. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Phelps Turner. I'm here with my colleague Angela Mayo. We represent Appellant's Conservation Law Foundation and Green Roots. This is no ordinary permitting dispute. This is a case of first impression involving the inju environmental justice mandates of the 2021. It's actually ordinance. a case of second impression. We did this <laughs> two years ago. Um, <laughs> respectfully, I, I, um, I disagree. There, there was a One case. One thing that would be very helpful for me is when you make your arguments this time to make it clear where we're dealing with a different issue than the one we decided recently. Absolutely. Because a lot of this seems to be rehash. I understand there's some differences, but it would be very useful for you to focus on where there's a difference in the record that we need to answer. Uh, absolutely, Your Honor, and that, that is my plan for today. Good. <clears throat> um, the reason I say it's a case of first impression is because this case, unlike the last case that was before you, is governed in part by the roadmap law and the environmental justice mandates contained therein, sections 56 through 60. <clears throat> the, the law that was enacted, the roadmap law, is a landmark piece of legis legislation that was enacted. Um, that was enacted. How's the law different from, we, we did an environmental justice analysis last time. How is the law different? And is, is it just the MEPA issue? The, um, DEP issue, be specific. There, there, are, there are several new issues before you, legal issues before you. The environmental justice mandates define several terms, including environmental burdens and environmental benefits. Mm -hmm. But I think most importantly, the statute codifies the, the state's environmental justice principles, which before only appeared in policies and executive orders. Now it's in the so statute. So how did the board violate these equal environmental justice um, mandates. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the analysis starts and ends in the definitions and, and the statutory provisions concerning environmental justice. I mentioned uh, there are definitions for environmental burdens and environmental benefits. But not energy but benefits. Not, not energy benefits. That, that's correct. But I, I think one of the most important provisions is in uh, Section 60 of the Roadmap Law that talks about the requirement that the board um, consider environmental justice principles. And it defines those principles. There, there are two key components. One, the meaningful involvement of all people in the, in the development, implementation, and enforcement of, an, of environmental laws. And I think more importantly, ensuring the equitable distribution of environmental and energy benefits. I, my memory may be dim, but I believe those are the same principles that we interpreted previously, except there is an issue possibly about DEP in here. Aren't the principles the same? The, the principles are similar, uh, but I, I, I would urge that the court consider that b before, before you the last time, the, the, the case was argued around the environmental justice policy and not an environmental justice statute. The legislature is Right, but fit. the principles are the same, as, as far as I can tell. It's that the application may differ, at least on this issue of water dependent use. Is, is, does this really boil down to that issue? Uh, no, no, not, not at all. And I, I, one thing that the, that the statute does is define environmental burdens. And I, I want to read a couple of quick excerpts from that definition. The, the policy never defined environmental benefits and burdens. And the, the statute, the legislature, saw fit to uh, enshrine uh, in the law definitions uh, of environmental burdens, including uh, activities that limit access to natural resources and constructed outdoor recreational facilities and venues. Uh, in this case, I, I, um, I'd like to highlight some of the burdens uh, that are relevant uh, in, this, in this instance. Uh, the, the siting board has approved a permit for an electric substation in an environmental justice population. East Boston meets all the criteria for injustice, environmental justice populations, including race, income, we, and English we, Again, language. we said that last time. We agree. That, that's, that's right. So right. Some, and this, the burdens, this property is heavily contaminated, right? The property itself can't be a park, correct? The, um, in, in, fact, in fact, Your Honor, um, the record indicates that the 
the, the site was previously planned to be open space, and we, we highlight this in our reply brief, uh, and it is now planned, obviously, to be a substation. But, but, but the city recognized it was going to be incredibly costly, um, and how much was it going to cost to turn this into a park? Um, and they, they had no money to do the remediation, and this is actually going to result in the remediation of that property, right? Uh, the, the, the property, <clears throat> your, your Honor, was re remediated to a level suitable for a substation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't comment. To remediate to a level of a park would be, how much would it cost to remediate to the level of a substation? Well, I, I don't have the f figures off, 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 the top, off the top of my head. I I'm just, I, I really, getting to specifics would be really helpful. Um, yeah, Go sure. ahead. Sure. So, so I, I highlighted this this excerpt in the environmental burdens definition, and I, I wanna I wanna highlight that this substation will contribute to and exacerbate environmental burdens in East Boston. That that's um, that's what's relevant here. East Boston, as we know from the record and and from reliable evidence, is host to numerous polluting and industrial sites, including Logan Airport and supporting facilities that cause air and noise pollution. It's host to entrances and exits to two tunnels causing uh, air pollution. It also hosts uh, petroleum terminals and shipping terminals which cause air and water pollution. It lacks green space and has very low tree canopy rates that leave its residents susceptible to, uh, more susceptible to the heat island effect, flooding and air pollution. And as the amicus pointed out um, in, it, in its brief, 70% of the state's substations are disproportionately located within one mile or inside environmental justice populations. And this, um, this substation adds to and exacerbates the burdens faced by the environmental justice population in East Boston. Now, despite these demonstrated burdens, the siting board in its decision found that the burdens associated with this project are, quote, construction related, short lived, minor, and fully mitigated, unquote. And if you look at the record and, and you read our briefs, you'll see that, that this finding was arbitrary and capricious based on, based on the evidence in the record. Would you agree that the statute requires the board to consider environmental principles, but it doesn't eliminate the board's um, responsibility to balance competing factors in ultimately making its decision? Yes, I, I, I. So it's a it's a mandate to consider. It's not a mandate that overrides all other considerations. Correct. Uh, that, yeah, that's that's right. I would urge. So the board ultimately, the board's decision, balancing decision, is subject to what level of review? I, I, I would urge the court to consider, though, that un unlike some traditional environmental frameworks that require an agency or a board to weigh project project benefits and burdens, here the board was tasked with considering and advancing the equitable distribution of benefits and burdens. So it's, it's a different exercise, and we believe that the court, uh, the, the, excuse me, the board failed to, to, to fully uh, comply with that. Sure, I understand your position, but what is the standard of review that we are to employ when reviewing the board's balancing of these competing considerations? Well, I think um, based on, on this court's case law with respect to energy facility siting board uh, decisions, th there, are, there are a couple of things. One, with respect to statutory interpretation, um, you know, th there, is, uh, there is substantial deference given, given to the agency, but we feel here that the, the, the interpretation of key terms and provisions in the statute were incorrect. That, that's the first, that's what, the first what, thing. What was incorrect? I'm sorry? What was incorrect about their interpretation of the statute? Well, they, um, the, what was incorrect was they, they disregarded evidence that squarely fit within the definition. But that sounds like a factual question. You're, you're suggesting, though, that as a matter of law, they misinterpreted the statute. What, what is the well, it's, I think question? It's, it's both. It's, it's a mixed question of fact and law here because they, they as, as we allege in our briefs, they misinterpreted, the, they misconstrued the statute to include, um, to not include certain benefits and burdens, and then they misapplied the statute. Um, with respect to the Could you be, license. again, as Justice Kafka was suggesting, more specific? More specific about the, 
No. Yeah, you're saying they misinterpreted the statute in Give us an example. ignoring some benefits or burdens. What sure. was what was sure? It? Absolutely. So as as I mentioned, um, their, their findings with respect to burdens, uh, actually in a 199 page decision, there is one sentence about burdens, and I've already that's it's, just it's, not true. I, I read I read through this. One, they present each side's argument in tremendous detail, painful detail. They go through each one of your arguments. And then they talk about these things. Um, well, each, uh, it's not a sentence on burdens. They discuss. Respectfully, respectfully the, Your Honor, they, they, they don't. Well, well, let me finish, because I, I find that it's really hard to figure out what you're complaining about when you do that. Give us an example. I understand very precisely your argument about water dependent use. But to say that they don't address burden, they only have one sentence addressing environmental burdens. Is, is just incorrect when you read. I mean, I read through this thing this morning. It's painfully detailed. Go ahead. It, it, is, it is detailed. It is lengthy. But I, I, I And it, it addresses every argument you make. It responds to them. It does every argument they make. It's, for state government work, it's exceptionally comprehensive. It, it, is, it is detailed yeah, and it is lengthy. But it, it other than a recitation of, of arguments, if you look at the analysis and findings section, there is very little discussion about burdens, which is the, the key issue here under the environment. One thing you Act. say in your brief is that if the community somehow pays for cleanup, if it affects their rates, that is inappropriate to consider. Is there any support for that um, in the law, that if, you, if it affects your rates, if it, it result, this results in an AUL on this property, right? This is something the environmental community pushes hard to clean up sites. You say that doesn't count for anything in the burden analysis because the community, like the rest of us, will be paying for it. Is there support in the law for that? No, no, it, it doesn't. It, it's it actually on the benefits side. They they claim that this is uh, a benefit right. uh, that the, the site was cleaned up. And no, no, we it, the the argument that we made in in our initial brief and in our reply brief. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a common sense argument about the fact that you that if if someone if someone gives you something and then asks you to pay for it later, it can't be considered a benefit. Well, but and if it results in a cleaner world, it does result in a benefit. Even we all pay well, taxes. So. That's fair. Regardless of what was going to happen with this site, it was going to need to be cleaned up. So, um, so. I, but no one was stepping forward to clean it up, right? The city didn't want to clean it up. It didn't have the money, right? Right. And and you want Massport, you want to build this on Massport's property, but Massport doesn't want it, right? They're they're refusing to provide the property. So is that a real option? Well, um, we we assert that th that wasn't fully litigated in this case. Um, that, that Massport was willing to give up the property. So is that an error of analysis in this that we can point out? Absolutely. We, so tell me yeah, why. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. In, in its final decision. Based on the record. Sure. In its, in its decision, the siting board says that alternative sites are outside of the scope of the certificate proceeding. We think that is legally inaccurate. Uh, if you look at the roadmap law. They say that you did not identify another reasonable site. Your proposal to put it on Massport, common in permitting and East Boston, I get it, but they don't want to give up the property. Massport's a constrained site too. It's operating an international airport in a tight, if they're not willing to give up the property, why is that a reasonable alternative? Uh, Your, Your Honor, th this, this was not fully litigated. This is one of the reasons the case needs to be remanded to the, to the board because this issue of alternative sites was not fully litigated. As you I can read from the final decision, Alternative sites were ruled outside the scope of the proceeding. That so was, no isn't record. that because that was part two of this saga? Sorry, part well, two of this. Part two of the saga. I mean, so part one, you had an initial site, and then it moved, I think, 190 feet, and that's the case that came to us. Yes, I, I appreciate the question. Siting, uh, the location was at issue previously, but I'll, I'll give you two reasons why siting and alternative sites is, is before, was, should have been before the board and should be before this court today. One, under the roadmap law, the environmental justice principles call for the equitable distribution of environmental and energy benefits and burdens. And, you can, and part of ensuring that there is an equitable distribution involves assessing where the site is located relative to other sites. But that's, and again, 
specifically, in, as J Justice Wendell points out, stage two, in stage one, there was an extensive analysis of possible sites, right? Extensive. Then there's a request to move at 190 feet, and there's an extensive analysis of that. Now you're asking to do it a third well, time. Uh, no, and we, we, feel, we feel it's required. Um, the second provision I'll state, uh, in addition to the, to the roadmap law, is section 69H. And, and uh, the board cites in its brief the town of Winchester versus Energy Facility Siting Board. And there, that, that case involved a transmission line, but it is relevant here uh, because it, it talks about, the, the appeals court talks about the board's mandate under section 69J and section 69H of chapter 164. And 69H governs in part this proceeding. And the court there talks about how um, the, 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 um, the siting board assessed uh, two, different, two different routes uh, using a multi-factor comparison under section 69H. And 69, section 69H, which talks about the three pillars of reliability, cost, and environmental impact, does in part govern this proceeding. I see, I see that my time is up. I, I would ask. Can you address the DEP issue? Because that's the one substantive issue that seems quite new, the, the, or the dependent use issue. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and in answering that question, just, they are going to get up and say, your Weymouth site is different. This is fact specific. They're also going to say DEP, which normally is not aligned with the, department, the energy department. They're protecting the environment. They both agree this is a water dependent use. So, Explain how you still win in that context. Uh, uh, sure, as, as, we, as we argue in our brief, uh, we, we believe um, um, that this case is, uh, this substation is non-water dependent. And I, I will note that this is a new, a new part of- Is that a question of law, fact, or a mixed question of law and fact? I, I would say it's mixed uh, because, because it does involve- Oh, so our standard of review is? Well, the, 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 I think the, the standard um, the, the, the standard that the court has to apply um, is based on pre prior precedent um, involving uh, incorrect interpretation because we do believe there is an incorrect interpretation here of the the waterways uh, law and regulations. Um, so whether whether the the um, whether the uh, board's findings were abusive discretion or arbitrary and capricious in interpreting the waterways law and the regulations. Hmm. Can I ask one, has DEP, is, is this case decided this DEP issue yet? Uh, I, I, you wrote your briefs, I can't remember how many months ago, but is, do we have a resolution of this case? It, has this gone on to appeal the DEP decision here or is that all held in abeyance for this? And the Weymouth one, what is its status? I don't believe we have a decision in, in the case involving Weymouth, um, which is, the, which is the, the, the cases that were argued for, for you by, by, by us. Um, so that hasn't gone on appeal yet? Not to my it's knowledge. It's back to DEP? That's, that's right, not to my knowledge. And um, DEP, from what I understand from the briefing, the last decision in DEP said is in favor of the, that it's a water dependent use, or is that incorrect? Or is it still unresolved? It's, it's, un, it's unresolved because it, it's, it was sent back by the, it was remanded by the Superior Court, and so it's, un, it's unresolved. So they haven't, I understand there was a preliminary decision by one decision maker at DEP. It went up to another decision maker. That decision maker has not issued a second decision out of DEP? Not to my knowledge, okay. not, not to my knowledge. Um, I, I see. Them, I, I would just close by saying, if, if the roadmap law uh, and the environmental justice mandates in it are to have any meaning and to move the Commonwealth away from business as usual permitting uh, in environmental justice populations, then the decision must be vacated and remanded. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Ramos. <coughs> Good morning, and may it please the court. Adam Ramos, Special Assistant Attorney General on behalf of the Energy Facility Siting Board. I think some of the uh, questions from the, from the court this morning to uh, Attorney uh, Turner uh, sort of hit the nail on the head. This is a case where the Energy Facility Siting Board fulfilled its statutory obligation 
the energy facilities siting board exists because the Commonwealth recognized the need for an expert agency with statewide um, perspective to consider all of the relevant factors that go into a determination of where energy infrastructure should be sited in order to ensure that every population in the state receives reliable energy. As Justice Wentland and Justice Kafker pointed out, this is the third time through the ringer on this particular project for the siting board and the second time that it has come to this court. It is important to point out that this time we are here on an appeal from a decision from the siting board's certificate authority. And the certificate authority is doing something very specific. It is taking a look at a project that has already been approved, determined to be needed to provide reliable energy. It is on a particular site and it is coming back before the board because the local permitting agencies have somehow impaired the ability of the construction to go forward so that the siting board exercising its expertise can determine whether to stand in the shoes of those permitting agencies and issue those permits through a certificate. In this particular instance- Although they, there, there does seem to be a fair amount of new evidence presented, right? Uh, you know, it, it wasn't sort of limited to a narrow question of law. There, the, the agency, because of the passage of time, takes into account a bunch of new information, right? That is absolutely correct, Justice Kafker. The agency refreshes the record on a variety of issues, including the question of need. Um, and in this particular case, it even went so far as to uh, do uh, an analysis of alternative technologies, uh, given the passage of time, and, and compared the feasibility of those alternative technologies against the project to ensure that it was making a decision that uh, still stood the test of time, essentially, as, as it did when it made its initial determination of need. I do want to point out another thing, and I think that... Um, Can you address, before you move, the environmental justice arguments what is, what is your sense of what is new and what is not there? Because we did an environmental justice analysis. We looked at a lot of these principles. We drew a distinction between when MEPA requires uh, um, the first step in their process and when they don't. So I'm trying to understand, is there anything new from this roadmap law that you think required consideration <coughs> besides this issue of water dependent use? There was no new evidence uh, or no evidence that was any different from what was presented before regarding environmental justice and the, and the weighing of, of well, burdens and benefits. But, but just as you said, they take into account some new technologies and new batteries and new electrical advances. So there is some of that going on in this decision, which relates to environmental justice issues, right? Uh, it relates to it, but it wasn't done directly because of environmental justice issues. It, it was the overall assessment of whether or not the need determination um, stands up. It, and it also relates to the question um, of the, uh, you know, uh, of, of whether or not it was appropriate to build the substation at all. Uh, and it was determined that it was. They refreshed the evidence on need. Uh, the Roadmap Act. It does seem to me that East Boston bears its, um, a, a, at least at a superficial level, a disproportionate share of the costs and burdens, environmental burdens, of energy. And <coughs> I'm wondering how this decision, which I, I understand is just about um, getting the certificates in place, isn't more of what um, your opposing counsel said, business as usual. Right? How, how, how is citing this substation in East Boston that already bears a disproportionate share of these burdens um, consistent with the equal justice mandates of the new law? Thank you, Justice. Uh, to begin, uh, East Boston is actually the only neighborhood in the city of Boston that does not have a substation at present. And this particular substation is needed particularly to provide energy reliability benefits to the population of East Boston. And Chelsea. 
and Chelsea, absolutely. Um, and the, uh, the siting board strongly considered uh, all of the benefits and burdens associated with the substation. The evidence showed that there, for example, the visual uh, burdens will be mitigated because of the uh, community benefits agreement that the siting board directed needed to be uh, negotiated with the neighborhood so that it will not be an eyesore, for example. They'll be getting the benefits, as Justice Kafker, I think, highlighted during questioning of, uh, of Attorney Turner, um, that of remediating a, a contaminated site. The evaluation of- it's, it's across the street from a playground, right? It is. Okay. Yeah. Can you address that aspect of this? Uh, it is across the street from... I mean, sure, the kids won't see it, but are there um, issues associated uh, with siting an electrical substation in East Boston across the street from one of the only playgrounds in the town? Uh, I wouldn't say that there... I mean, I suppose there are issues. Those issues are considered. The, all of the protections that are associated with the development of this substation are such to avoid safety issues, for example. The siting board is required that a site-specific safety plan be developed with respect to this substation. And, and I mentioned the visual issues, but there was an evaluation of other types of health impacts that might come from a substation, such as EMF exposure and things like that. And it was determined that it was not, that there would not be increased levels of EMF exposure at a distance as far away as the playground is from the substation. So the it is not the siting board takes very seriously the concerns around uh, environmental justice and making sure that the populations that are going to be impacted by this construction are uh, protected from undue burdens uh, that would be associated with this. And they, their, their role is to take into account what the benefits are that will come and what the burdens are that will come from it and determine whether or not this is the appropriate place at the appropriate time. To and put does that benefits and burdens um, calculus consider the existing burdens to the community? Or is it benefits and burdens of this particular project? I would say it does, and it does in some respects, and, and in some respects it doesn't. So there are certain types of projects that are, that require um, so let's just stick with this project. I mean, in, in, in weighing the benefits and burdens of this project, is the existing burden on East Boston already considered? It definitely weighs into the calculus. And where is that in the board's decision? I think it's reflected through the entirety of the evaluation of the benefits and burdens. It's the, there's a, a recognition of, of what community this is in. Don't um, you, you don't start, it, it's the trigger. I mean, that's, you wouldn't do the environmental justice analysis if this was Wellesley. You do it because it's East Boston. That's, I think, isn't that recognized? That, that's right up front. You're doing this because East Boston is, fits within the definition of environmental justice community, right? That's exactly right. The environmental justice community in and of itself is one that is, by definition, overburdened. And can the, I ask what, can you consider, I mean, one of the often, Low-income environmental justice communities have a lack of power, too. They're the first ones that go out when the storm hits. Is that a appropriate consideration in the environmental justice analysis as well? Yes, it is. That's something that I mean, ensuring energy reliability is an energy benefit that the energy that the siting board considered. And I, I just I feel it appropriate to point out that the amicus brief submitted by the Union of Concerned Scientists, which was ostensibly uh, opposed to the project, pointed out in two places, uh, I think it's worth reading the quotes, one, lack of access to reliable energy is an energy injustice, and two, access to reliable energy is a benefit and a key component of energy justice. And those are things that the siting board certainly considered with respect to determining that this should be placed in the, uh, it was appropriate to issue the certificate in this proceeding. I do see that I'm out of time. But one last question on the, um, 100 year survey is, is there the flooding issue and whether you have to consider 100 years versus um, 75 years is there something new here we dealt with this issue last time I'm just trying to get a sense is there something new we have to resolve on that issue 
Because there's new, right, there's some new information presented on that, or am I wrong on that? There's not new information presented on, on the flooding issue. The, the, it was still uh, a question of what, what so that's, time frame you're looking at. So that yeah. one, we can write a sentence saying you decided that issue, or is I there? think so, yes. You could, on that one, yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Attorney Rosenzweig. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, David Rosenzweig, appearing on behalf of uh, Instar Electric Company, doing business as Eversource Energy. Uh, turning directly to the questions that were asked, with respect to the Roadmap Act, it imposes two obligations on the siting board. One of them I don't believe is at issue, which was already decided by the court in the first Green Roots decision a year and a half ago, and that is whether the siting board's procedures allow for a meaningful opportunity for the public's participation, EJ populations, in its review. Uh, I don't think there's a serious argument there. The argument comes down to whether the siting board conducted a reasonable analysis in considering the energy benefits, environmental benefits, and weighing that, those against the environmental burdens. And the siting board's analysis here was extensive. They very reasonably construed the statute as um, including in that equation the reliability benefits of a reliable energy supply, which is critically important for all communities, but particularly EJ communities. And here they found a very acute, time-sensitive need, particularly given the delays associated with permitting this facility. And they included within that analysis um, the, the benefits of um, the Community Benefits Agreement, which provided significant tree canopy, um, Enhanced oh, funding for was it really significant or so I thought it was like five trees or something uh, like that. I had a list of things, but tree can canopies was one of the items. Um, funding uh, to, trees are the trees, trees are kind of not a lot, right? You're not really relying on tree cover. Right? They, they were going to be at the playground to help screen the playground and, and provide more shade and cover for, to the users of the recreational area um, that's adjacent across the street from the substation site. But the Community Benefits Agreement in total has about a million and a half dollars of benefits that include funding for uh, recreational use and enhancing the urban wild that's adjacent to the substation site. These are direct benefits to the community. Um, and while they talk about the costs and they have concerns about that on the appellant side, those costs will actually be borne and shared and spread across, uh, across the Eversource uh, uh, territory. So they are not receiving an inequitable so summarize, costs. summarize for me the environmental benefits to the community as you understand it. It's the cleaning up of the property, which would otherwise not be cleaned up, right? It's Correct. this tree canopy. It's what else? It's mm -hmm. the remediation of the site, um, which is separate from the community benefits agreement by removing essentially 10,000 um, tons of contaminated soil as well as thousands of gallons of contaminated groundwater. That was at a cost of uh, $5 million, roughly. Um, Justice Kapker, you asked that earlier. Those are very significant benefits that were not materializing when the uh, property was in the hands of the city of Boston. Uh, so those are very important, significant benefits, uh, environmental can benefits. I, can I ask the effect? I have some knowledge of AULs and remediation, but so you've got, as Justice Winland points out, a park next to this. How does, does, when you clean up that neighboring property to an AUL level, how do, what's that effect on the, is that making it safer for the people in the park or how, how does that work? Well, well, it ensures that some of those contaminated soils um, do not escape off site by removing them from the site. Uh, the contamination, the, 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 the remedi remediation here was to remediate it to a level that would accommodate a substation. If it was going to be a recreational use, and it had never been a recreational use, it had longstanding use by the city of Boston as a uh, Department of Public Works depot, um, and it would not be a uh, recreational use without right. significantly additional remediation that the city was not intending to perform. So go ahead, keep going. The environmental benefits of the property, are, what, what else? Now, also, is within the definition of um, en uh, environmental benefits is uh, access to clean, renewable energy. That's within the definition that's provided by statute. Um, without a reliable energy supply, without transmission, without a substation, this community would be foreclosed from 
being able to access renewable energy, green energy, to serve its energy needs. That's a very important consideration to the Siting okay, Board. So opposing counsel says you didn't do enough reasonable alternative analysis. Massport could, as always in East Boston, Massport should be the one. So what's your answer to that? That issue was fully and fairly litigated in the prior proceedings and um, so the Siting Board's policy, as well as this court's affirmed that so is there nothing, I just want to make sure, is there nothing new on alternative analysis? Did, again, I skimmed through this 220-page decision. I haven't read it yet fully, but is there anything there re-upping the alternative site analysis? The, there was no new evidence other than a confirmation that Logan Airport was not available as a site. That was reconfirmed during the proceeding. It was part of the record of the proceeding. They were, and the siting board made the finding that... Um, there was no location outside of Tidelands. This is the sole location that was available for this substation use. In fact, it was earmarked by the city of Boston through an RFP as part of a land swap where the city had as one of the conditions for its RFP that the use of the property would go to the beneficial interests of the residents of East Boston, where reliability and substation is a key component of that. And can you, before we lose you, the DEP issue. Yes. So it's, we don't have a definitive decision out of DEP in the other case, right? Uh, I understand that your agency, his agency, is empowered to make this determination with or without DEP. Here, it's a lot easier when DEP agrees with you. So far, DEP agrees with you in your case, right? But it doesn't, it hasn't resolved the other case? That's correct, Your Honor. The, the other case is different. It's materially different. The facility is different. It's not defined as an ancillary facility, unlike a substation. There was evidence in the Weymouth case that... I thought it uh, was in the Weymouth. I thought the Weymouth case also has it as... It, it wasn't an ancil ancillary facility in Weymouth as it, well? It is not within the definition of DEP's waterways regulations at 310 CMR 9.02. A substation is. It's the first listed facility. What, what is this? Could you slow that down? 310? 310. 310. Yeah. Code of Mass Regulations 9.02. Uh, there is no mention of a gas compressor station. And the, the evidence was that the gas pipeline there was working effectively without a compressor station. Just to pose the facts here, without the substation, the transmission lines that are um, already licensed by DEP would not work and serve their intended purpose. Um, there's other issues such as the siting of that gas compressor station, the evidence in the Weymouth case is that there were locations out of Thailand that would accommodate that use. That's squarely not the case here. So the, the facts are materially different, but to get right to the heart of your question, um, DEP has not resolved that issue, um, and it's still pending. But DEP in this case had affirmative testimony from their head of their waterways licensing division that they agreed with the, um, uh, they three times found that this facility was water dependent and agreed with the siting board rolling it into the certificate for purposes of the, of the substation. I, uh, I see my time is up. Unless the court has a further questions, uh, we rest on our briefs. 